Jim Salter is a personal friend, a friend of All Things Open. He's been a speaker really since even before we started All Things Open. We were doing open source events e even before, 10 years ago, even before we did All Things Open, and Jim was speaking at those events as well. He's a 20-plus year uh, system administrator, practicing sysadmin. He now works for a pretty well-known local company, and prior to that, he was working with Ars Technica. Jim, you were writing some articles, featured articles, feature articles that some of you probably read. So whether you realize it or not, a lot of you here have probably read Jim Salter's stuff on Ars Technica. So he kind of knows what he's talking about. We like to spotlight him and host him whenever we can. So Jim, take about 10 minutes, talk about Sanoid, show the project, and maybe give some of the background, ways to contribute, problems that it solves, and things like that. So I'm going to turn this over to you. Hi, folks. Uh, how many folks here are not familiar at all with what ZFS is? Okay, cool. So uh, to understand Sanoid, you have to at least have a vague idea of ZFS because everything Sanoid does orchestrates ZFS operations. ZFS is a really cool next generation file system that allows you to do lots of advanced things like snapshot the entire file system instantly and take up almost no uh, actual space on disk and what that snapshot actually is, is the entire condition of your disk and all the files and data on it preserved until you destroy that snapshot. So that makes it really easy to go and undo uh, really ugly mistakes you might have made or even malicious things that might have happened if somebody hacked into your system. And a lot of our presentation tonight is going to talk about that. Um, also, I'd like to apologize a little bit. Uh, normally, my presentations are like full-on slide decks, practiced in advance, the whole nine. Um, do I have any old school UFC fans in the audience tonight? Any? So, I guess the, I guess the reference won't mean anything. This is my Tank Abbott moment. Tank Abbott was a fighter in the very early days of the UFC. Who one of the things he was infamous for is if a fighter got injured, uh, you could just call Tank at the bar and he would hop up a bar stool and fly out to wherever the UFC was and fight whoever it was who needed fighting. So this is kind of my Tank Abbott moment. Um, this laptop was. Brand new, as of today, I installed Ubuntu on it about an hour before the presentation. And uh, while Vera was talking, I installed all my software on it and a few VMs. So um, what we're looking at right here on the screen right now is the, uh, the GitHub project page for Sanoid itself, uh, which is the primary place for you to go and either contribute or grab copies of it. Although at this point, um, if you are, do we have any Ubuntu users in the crowd? You can actually just apt install Sanoid now. Um, it's we're in the Sanoid, we're in the Ubuntu repositories, Debian, um, Arch AUR, and honestly, I've lost track at this point of all the other places you can get it. But the canonical source and where the development happens is here on GitHub. Um, I am going to do a quick. I'm just going to play us a video real quick and show you what we're doing. Assuming our Wi-Fi wants to cooperate. Oh, good, and we have an ad. No, we, we don't. You can stop now. <sighs> Come on. Where's the skip? Where'd you go? There we go. Yes, please go away. Thank you. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. So what we're looking at here is a Windows Server 2012 VM. And... Uh, we're going to go ahead and infect it with crypto malware, which is always really fun. So this particular variant of crypto malware is not one of the actual nasty ones you encounter in the wild. And the major reason for that is because it's actually hard to find a working copy of live ransomware because the command and control servers get nuked so frequently. If you didn't harvest it like that day, it probably won't work. Um, I have another demo now that has an, an actual installation of Locky, but this was the first working thing that I found. It's called EduCrypt. And the guy who wrote this, his idea was if you get nailed by this, it will actually encrypt all your stuff, but everybody has the same key and he published it. So you can decrypt it yourself easily. Um, he put it out there hoping that people who got infected would learn a lesson from it, basically. So as we're running this, uh, this malware, you can see the disk usage on resource monitors spiking way up. And you can see that the icons changed on our desktop because all of our files now have been replaced 
with little text files that, you know, basically say, you suck, you got infected, you know, don't be so dumb. Now, as I mentioned, this is a virtual machine. Uh, this Windows VM is running on top of an Ubuntu host. And what we're about to do now is we're going to drop down to the command line and we're going to use ZFS and Sanoid to just roll back the VM and undo all the damage that we just did to it. Now remember, we literally encrypted everything on that VM's drive. So we listed all the snapshots, and you see automatically taken snapshots with date stamps on them, and also a manual one that I took right before I had infected everything. And now, we're already done. We already rolled back the VM. Now all we have to do is boot it. And when we log in, you'll note that our icons are back. Our PDFs are PDFs again, and not text files insulting our intelligence. All right. So basically, that's enough of that. And we can move on to looking at some more practicals. Uh, that text size is probably going to be a little small for you folks, isn't it? Let's bump that up a little. That'll probably work. Yeah, it looks better. All right. So Sanoid's config files live in, et cetera, Sanoid. Surprise, surprise. And the main one is sanoid.comp itself. I like to think this is pretty human readable. Uh, we have two pools on this machine. Uh, it, as a pool is the base level of storage for ZFS. And I created two different pools, one named data and one named backup, because it helps us simulate a little bit the idea of having multiple machines. And a lot of what we're going to talk about is applicable not only for backing things up on this machine itself, but you can also back up very easily and rapidly over the network to another one. Having two separate pools just kind of makes it a little easier to visualize that since I've really only got the one laptop here. So you see for each of our pools, we've got two data sets, presentations and images. Uh, images contains all of our VMs, which we've got a freshly installed Windows Server 2019. And you can see for each one of these, we say use template equals production on the, uh, the data pool. And we say use template equals backup on the backup pool. You don't have to use templates at all, but they make your life a lot easier we can examine what each template actually means a little further down in the file. We can see that we're taking 36 hourlies, 30 dailies, and three monthlies. We're automatically taking snapshots, and we're automatically thinning them when they get stale, you know, meaning they're past the, the date that we've set with this policy. So like if we say we want 36 hourly snapshots, once we have 37 hourlies and the oldest one is more than 36 hours old, Sanoid will destroy it automatically for you. Uh, similarly, when we say we want to take 36 hourlies, um, every hour on the hour will take a new hourly. And on a laptop like this machine here, we can also see do, 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 do. Ah. I am also not used to having to one hand type when I give a presentation. All right, so we can see all the image, all the, uh, the snapshots on the machine here. And if you look up towards the top, you'll notice that some of them have kind of weird timestamps. Uh, we've got an hourly that was taken at 6.30, not at 6 o'clock. We've got another hourly that was taken at 6.56 and 18 seconds, not 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock. And the reason for that is this laptop was powered off for some of the time today. And Sanoid is also smart enough to say, hey, if for some reason the last hourly or the last daily that should have been taken uh, did not get taken, we'll go ahead and take one immediately now. But we're not going to push back the time when we ought to take an hourly at the top of the hour or a daily at 11.59 you know, p.m. at night. We're just going to go ahead and take one immediately now because we missed one and take another one the next time that we really ought to be taking one. So um, it's as tolerant as it can possibly be of environmental issues and all that kind of thing. And that's the, so Sanoid itself is the part that takes and destroys these snapshots for the most part. 
Sanoid can also uh, perform some monitoring for you. So if we say Sanoid monitor snapshots, we'll see it says, okay, all of our monitor data sets, and that's everything that we had in that config file on backup and data both, have fresh snapshots. That means they've got snapshots according to policy. They've got an hourly within the last hour, a daily within the last day, and so forth. And those policies are actually a little different for the data and for the backup. The backup will let you get a little bit staler because it can't take its own snapshots. They get replicated in from the production side. And let's take a look at what that means really quickly. So I mentioned that uh, while Veer was talking, I set up a Windows VM on this box. We'll go ahead and start that thing now. Alrighty, so we've got a nice, perfectly functional Windows Server 2019 VM, right? We can log into it, we can look around, everything's fine and dandy. We can also do horrible things to it. Um, one, of the thing, one of the things that I like to do to, to demonstrate the idea of completely de uh, screwing up a VM, especially a Windows one, is uh, just delete System32. Unfortunately, there's so many molly guards on that now that you're like clicking, yes, I really want to do this, and yes, do that, and no, don't do that for like five minutes and then waiting for things to delete. So instead, I did that while we were waiting and took a snapshot for it. So we're going to look at all of our snapshots for the Windows VM. You can see we've got several with timestamps here. These are the ones that Sanoi took automatically. You can also take manual snapshots, which I did here. And you can see one of these is named at Dell System 32 lol. So that was immediately after I deleted System 32 and also the rest of the Windows directory, just to, for good measure. And so we are just going to roll back to that real quick. Well, we also need to roll back and not rule back. All right, so we just rolled back, and we actually, that operation, as quick as it was, actually entailed deleting about 10 gigs worth of things that Windows really needed, as we can see. <laughs> All right, so that was bad. We don't like that. Now, what we could also do we could just roll back one further. So we've still got our gold snapshot before that, and that was when Windows was all set up and before I did something horrible and stupid to it. But we've got another option because we've got that backup pool and we've been replicating to it. So we're going to look at backup images windows. And you can see we've still got all of our snapshots there. So we're going to use the other half of Sanoid, which is a, an app called Syncoid that automates ZFS replication, and we're going to pull that Windows at recovered snapshot back onto the production side. And we're actually going to get a little bit fancy with that. So the ZFS veterans in the house, I know we've got a few, are aware that you can use Syncoid and ZFS replication, but normally you've got to be root for that, right? So this is kind of a little bit of a permissions problem. If you're actually replicating between machines, you end up publishing root keys. So if you get if you compromise one of them, you've really fully compromised the other one if you have any idea those keys have been published. But that's no longer something that you absolutely have to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate privilegeless replication instead. Okay, so now I'm logged in as the receive user. The only permissions I really have here are what's required to receive incoming replication. I can't even look at the contents of my data folder. If I try, I get permission denied because I have no privileges whatsoever. But what I can do is syncoid uh, send user. I've got another unprivileged user who only has the privileges needed to send data sets. And I'm going to go from my backup pool, images, windows.
to my production pool named data. And that's going to get me that at recovered snapshot back, which is where I want to be. As I mentioned, this is actually quite a bit of data because basically the only thing on that VM is the Windows directory and I deleted all of it. So we are going to recover about 10 gigs worth of stuff here real quick. Maybe I should have deleted slightly fewer files instead of going for the overkill. Okay. Three, two, one. All righty. So now, if we look at... Do, 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 data images windows, we can see that we have that at recovered snapshot back. That also means that the condition of our live file system on data images windows is the same as it was in that snapshot. And what that means in practice is that now the moment of truth do we blue screen? And of course, we do not because we recovered from the horrible things that we did. So this is basically what Sanoid is really all about. And it doesn't have to be about VMs. There are lots of, I mean, there are at this point tens of thousands of people using this software just for like regular files, you know, the stuff in your user folder, your pictures, your Word documents, you know, your whatever. I just, I work with VMs a lot and VMs are traditionally one of the biggest pains in the butt to back up quickly and reliably. And as you can see, this is kind of a game changer, especially, you know, if you're not going to spend thousands and thousands of dollars of licenses on uh, VMware and, and Veeam and everything else. And even if you did spend all that money, frankly, this works better. It's quicker. All right. So we have seen a practical demonstration. Uh, we've seen the code. We've seen uh, Sanoid can also monitor the health of your pool. So on this particular laptop, our uh, our storage is ridiculously simple. Our pools are actually just files on the drive. But uh, normally, you would have multiple disks involved in each of your pools. And if you lose a disk or you get errors or whatever, this uh, monitor health right here will check all the pools that Sanoid knows about, and it will let you know what's going on. Now, you may notice that both monitor health and monitor snapshot started out with an OK here. Uh, that's because there are three conditions they can return, OK, Warn, and Crit, and if there are any monitoring gurus in the house who've used Nagios, that might sound familiar. And that's because both of these modes of operation function perfectly well as Nagios plugins. So in my real infrastructure, I actually have this tied directly in, and if I stop receiving snapshots on a backup server or if I throw a disk on a server or whatever, I'm actually going to immediately, my phone is going to start blowing up in my pocket and irritate me until I go and figure out what's going on. So rather than having a really unpleasant surprise when I come into work on Monday, I have a really unpleasant surprise at you know 8.30 on a Saturday night, but at least I know what my Monday morning is going to look like. Um, all right, so uh, we're about out of time here, but uh, pivoting back to the, um, to the GitHub page for a second. Uh, I'll just mention, so... Sanoid is written in Perl, which I know is kind of an odd choice in 2022, but uh, like Todd mentioned, I've been a system administrator for a very long time, and uh, it was a good language. We've got uh, quite a lot of contributors. At this point, we have uh, 2.2 thousand stars, 234 forks. Um, when I first developed this project, it was literally just me out there putting it on the web, and I'm still kind of haven't gotten used to the idea that I have an entire community out there. Uh, we have got a lot of active development, and I have written almost none of the new code in about two years, which is pretty amazing for me to have graduated from reluctant coder to reluctant manager of coders. <laughs> so that's about all I've really got for you tonight. Like I said, I apologize. Usually I got a much slicker, more prepared presentation. This is what I could do with like half an hour worth of notice. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask? Bueller? Yeah. 
Yep, yep. Uh, the question was, how long does it take to spin up Sanoid on a new system? And like, if you were installing Ubuntu server from scratch, your first step would be apt install ZFS utils Linux to get ZFS itself installed. Uh, your next step would be if you want to go the package manager route and be um, you know, use a little bit older version that has made it into Ubuntu's repos, although they're all quite functional. You can literally just apt install Sanoid. It's instant. It's installed, and uh, you get a you get a demo version of the uh, config file that you saw that you can very quickly edit into exactly what you want. The templates that you saw are already provided. They're already there. They can be edited, or you can use them as is. So there's basically almost no donkey work involved. You can be up in seconds. Um, if you want the latest version, uh, I actually don't have an installer on GitHub because, again, it's just Perl scripts. There's like three of them to fetch and dump into user local bin, which is actually how I do it on my systems. Um, I've actually, on my server, I've got a little uh, lazy short link that goes directly to the raw on the master on GitHub. So I can just wget, you know, Sanoid from my server, and it will get whatever the freshest is uh, from the uh, from the repo. Because I'm I'm pretty picky about what goes into the master. Obviously, uh, you know, if you're trying to have the most stable system, you probably shouldn't be fetching things directly from master on somebody's GitHub. But I generally don't accept a pull request until it's been pretty well tested, and I'm pretty sure it's not going to cause anybody any serious problems. So it's usually pretty safe to use. Now, you can also, of course, obviously, we have proper releases, and you can just click straight to the release page and know exactly what you're getting and grab it that way. Anybody else? Thanks, folks. <laughs>